very hard to say that. It is, I know, I've practised. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to come along on behalf of MPS and talk about the Barber Garber decision. Um, I was thinking of how to sort of introduce it, um, and it took me back to um, my early days as a partner in the, of a firm, and we were told how to market our services. Um, and uh, the idea of marketing our services was to make sure that we scared our clients, left them really scared, and then offered them the solution. Um, that was that was from a, an insurance salesman, so I suppose that was understandable. But I want to start off today by saying that my purpose today, hopefully, is not to scare you with the Barbara decision. So I want you to leave the, this presentation more comfortable about it in, 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 in the New Zealand context. And so if you leave nervous, then I think the presentation hasn't gone the way I would like it to go. Um, because, but, because, but I do think there's value in considering this, um, and to, because it does two things. There's always learnings you can take from this kind of, of happening, um, and I will hopefully, with the help of Dr. Kamenica at the end, go over those. And secondly, um, it's always good to learn from, from other people's mistakes and put that into context. So, um, so how many of you know, his, his, I mean, you've obviously read a lot about it. You know the circumstances of the Barber Cup. I'm going to just... The big, the big green button. Um, what I'm going to just tell you what I'm going to do, which is to, I, I will give you a, 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 uh, an overview of the a summary of what happened in the Barber Cup. Okay, so I'm sorry if that's going over some ground, but I think you do need to put it into context. Um, I want to explain the, the, the conviction in the UK context so that you can then get an understanding of how that is relevant in a New Zealand context or not relevant in a New Zealand context, as the case may be. Um, I, I, and then I will sort of deal with the, the UK outcome in terms of how that affected her and then come to some considerations or, or observations that we might discuss, hopefully at the end of the, uh, end of the um, presentation, if we have time. Um, so I will try and get through this relatively quickly because I would like um, to deal with it. Um, so who was Dr. Barbara Garber? Uh, she, was a, um, she was a junior doctor specialising in paediatrics, um, six-year paediatric registrar working in the Children's Assessment Unit at Leicester Royal Infirmary Hospital. Um, on the 18th of February, um, this was her first shift um, after 14 months maternity leave. Uh, she was cross-covering for an absent registrar and uh, an absent house officer. Uh, so that was in addition to her own duties. Um, Short-staffed at the, at the hospital, they had a lot of contract nurses in that day, so it was a pretty pretty bad, bad day in, in terms of, of, of staffing, which you'll all be aware of and have, have dealt with. Um, she, prior to this, she was at all times described as a very competent um, house. She, there, were, there were no issues with her prior to this. Um, let's turn to the 18th of, of February. That was the day. The, the day. Um, on the end of the February, Jack's, Jack Adcock's mother, um, together with his grandmother, took him to see Jack's GP. He'd been unwell throughout the night. Um, he'd been not with himself the previous day. Um, now, the GP notes noted that he was dehydrated. Um, he'd been vomiting and suffered from diarrhoea. His breathing was shallow and his lips were blue. Um, the GP referred him immediately to the hospital. Um, and before I deal with the admission, I'll just give you some background on Jack and his medical history, because I think that's important too. Um, he was a very much loved little boy. He was di had diagnosed from birth as Down syndrome. Um, as a baby, he was treated uh, for bowel abnormality and they had a hole in the heart. Um, this required surgery, uh, and as a result of which he required long-term medication and allopril. Uh, he was more susceptible to uh, coughs, colds, and resulting breathlessness as a result. Um, he had a history of requiring antibiotics, uh, and had throat and chest infections, and previously had one hospital admission for pneumonia. Uh, he was well supported by a very, very close family. Um, local doctors and learning support assistance was given to him, and he was in a, a, a local primary school. Um, so let's, let's now move to his uh, hospital admission. When he arrived, um, he was, uh, it was approximately 10.15 in the morning, and uh, he was unresponsive and limp. Um, the nurse who attended him immediately uh, referred him to Dr. Barbara Garber. She was the senior junior doctor at the time. He was initially treated for acute gastroenteritis and dehydration. Uh, he did not respond at all when the cannula was, was uh, administered. However, he started to um, improve uh, when he received fluids. Uh, Dr. Barragaba received blood results at that time. His blood gas reading showed he was acidotic. 
Um, he also had an extremely high lactate reading. Uh, she ordered a chest X-ray and repeat blood test to be carried out about midday. Um, the X-ray was not reviewed until about 3 p.m. that day, and upon seeing the results, Dr. Barbagaba prescribed antibiotics to treat the chest infection. Just dealing with the hospital admission, um, there was a delay with the blood results, which was caused by an IT issue, which was nothing to do with Dr. Barbagaba, and these results were indicative of infection, organ failure, and, and septic shock, and these arrived at 4.15. Um, now, Dr. Baba didn't, Baba Gaba didn't take any action in respect of those, and there was never any real explanation for that, and that was an omission. Um, the, unfortunately, at 4.30 or so, when a senior consultant arrived at the, at the ward for the normal handover, she failed to raise any issues regarding handover, flagging that high level, um, any concerns other than flagging the high level of CRP and a diagnosis of pneumonia. She actually commented that Jack was improving and bouncing about. At 6.30, she spoke again to a consultant and, um, and raised no concerns. Now, at approximately 7 p.m., Jack received what would have been his usual dose of enalapril. Um, now, this became relevant because th this was from his mother because he was on it and he was in the ward and he, his mother asked the nurse, can I, can I give him his enalapril? And she said yes. Um, but Dr. Barbagab had, had deliberately not prescribed an enalapril because she appreciated that would lower his blood pressure, perhaps because he was de dehydrated. Now, this was at the trial seen as a possible cause of the death, um, a possible cause of death, um, and it was nothing to do with Dr. Barbagaba. Um, and I'll come to that later as to why that's kind of relevant. Um, at 7.45, Jack's heart failed. Um, now, to compound issues, Dr. Barbagaba mistook Jack for a, a patient that had a DNR order and so delayed resuscitation. Again, at the trial, this was proved to have, have, have played no part in his death. It wouldn't have made a difference, but obviously it was an emotional time, um, traumatic for the parents, and it may have coloured um, a jury in thinking, you know, well, th th again, it was just a, a very uh, an unfortunate event. It's one of those situations, I know, I know this is one of those cases where if one thing goes wrong, perhaps a lot of things go wrong, and we've all had those situations. So what are the complaints that were made against Dr. Barbagaba? Well, there were a few of them, and they all... Basically, prior to the trial, these were the allegations that were made against her, that she'd ignored a history of diarrhoea and vomiting, that she ignored a patient who was lethargic and unresponsive, she ignored a young child who did not flinch when a cannula was, was, was inserted, she ignored the fact that it was raised body temperature, fever, but cold hands and feet, she ignores poor, ignored poor perfusion of the skin, Blood gas reading showing he was acidotic. A significant lactate reading in the same blood gas level, which was described as extremely high. The fact that all of this was in a patient with a history that made him particularly susceptible. So that was, they were the allegations before trial. And that trial even more came out. Um, she didn't properly review the chest X-ray taken at 12.01, which would have confirmed pneumonia. At uh, 12.10, she didn't obtain enough blood for Jack to properly repeat the blood test, gas test. And in the event, um, had ignored the previous one, failed to make proper clinical notes. There's always a notes issue in any of these, so her notes were scrutinised. Failed to ensure she re Jack received appropriate antibiotics timiously. Failed to obtain the results of blood tests ordered on her initial examination until about 4.15, and then failed to act on them. Now, that was an IT issue. So, so that was, I mean, why that was raised at trial is her, her issue, I don't know and failed to raise any issues at handover at 4.30 and 6.30. So those were the list of, of issues that were raised against Dr. Barbagaba, um, both before and during the trial. Um, so what happened? Barbara, Dr. Barbagaba was convicted for manslaughter by gross negligence under the UK law, and she received a suspended sentence of two years' imprisonment, and that was upheld on appeal. Um, so how does that happen in the UK? Let's go to the UK law. I mean, it's, it's a four-step test, all right? And it really it is, do you owe a duty of care to the patient? And clearly, I think that's, that's not controversial. Um, is that duty breached? Um, uh, was it an operative, an operative cause? And I use the word operative because of, of, of that analytical issue. It doesn't have to be the sole cause, or it doesn't, and there may be other causes, but is, it an operative, is the breach an operative cause? Um, and was it grossly negligent? Um, they're grossly negligent issue comes from a case, the Queen and Adamarco, which set that test. So it has to be grossly negligent. Now, a jury found all of those issues existed 
in the Baba Gaba decision, um, and we'll come to discuss that. But there were some huge mitigating factors, and I want to take you through those because you'll, I think, empathise with them. Um, and I, I think that they were perhaps largely ignored or devalued in this process. Um, first of all, she had Dr. Bugger had otherwise exemplary or good medical record. She was she was only a junior doctor. They, the, the, the hospital was severely understaffed on the day. Um, she was covering two other uh, consultants who hadn't attended. Um, she was at the end of a 30-hour shift. Um, IT failures played their part. And she remained employed after this by the hospital. Um, and it's worth note that it took three and a half years for the prosecution to even start. And almost four years later, over four years later, um, the, the, um, the, the trial. And in all that time, she had worked absolutely exemplary. There'd been no issues and no complaints. So this was just a day, one day issue a terrible day, you know, um, maybe a bad day at the office, depending on, on how you look at it. But it was one day, uh, and many, um, and there was a lot of, of good things to say about Dr. Baba Gaba. So what were the consequences of this prosecution to her? Um, she was suspended, uh, sentenced for two years. Um, the Medical Practitioners Tribunal suspended her for 12 months. Took, took, and they took account of the mitigating factors. Um, and that was the basis for them saying, well, you're going to be suspended for 12 months. But that was appealed by the GMC, and, um, and the High Court overturned that decision and, and removed her from the, from the register. Um, and that was a very, very controversial um, decision uh, and, and remains a very conf conf controversial decision. And I want to read you, because it, it, I want to read you the, the judges. I'm going to pick on lawyers and judges at a moment. I want to read you what the judge said in that case, because I think... Um, it, 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 it shows, uh, I think, a, um, an, a lack of understanding. Um, Dr. Baba Gaba, before and after the tragic events, was competent, above average doctor. The day brought its unexpected workload and strains and stresses caused by IT failings, consultant absences, and her return from maternity leave. But there was no suggestion that her training in diagnosis of sepsis or in testing potential diagnoses had been deficient, or that she was unaware of her obligations to assess for herself shortcomings or rustiness in her skills, and to seek assistance. There is no suggestion, unwelcome and stressful though the failings around her were, and with the workload she had, that this was something she had not been trained to cope with, or was something wholly out of the ordinary for a year six trainee, not far off consultancy, to have to cope with, without making such serious errors. It was her failings which were truly exceptionally bad. So, I mean, I think that is an incredibly um, tough and, 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 and lack of understanding approach. Um, and it was really lovely but because it created such a, a stir that there was a, an outpour, an outpour of support for, for Dr. Bargava. And this was the, a letter that was signed up to by 10,000 doctors uh, two days later. And this is what it said, and I think you might empathise with this. Every doctor has worked in similar conditions, and we have all made mistakes. In other safety critical industries, there is a clear understanding that human error is a fact of life that must be planned for. A pilot would never take off if the captain and most of his crew were not on the plane. Doctors do not have that option and frequently take on work of two or more in order to keep hospitals open. We have seen doctors punished for whistleblowing about unsafe staffing levels. We now see them being held criminally responsible for mistakes made whilst working under these pressures, which with chronic staff shortages, prolonged underfunding and low morale now occur with worrying frequency. So I think that sums it up and brings a bit of balance to that, that issue. Um, and what happened, so I'll come back to, to what happened later, but what I will do now is just deal with the law in New Zealand so that you, I'll answer your question, can this happen in New Zealand? Um, and I'm not trying to scare you, but the answer is yes, it can happen in New Zealand. I don't think it will happen in New Zealand, for reasons I'll come to, but if you want to be, absolutely, it can happen in New Zealand because our manslaughter by gross negligence sort of follows the UK thing. So you, there is a three-step test, which is similar, incorporates all of the four steps in the UK. Is there a duty of care? Yes, there is. Um, and that duty of care is is, in, is set out, and the standard of care is set out in section 150. And, and a person is criminally responsible for omitting to discharge or perform a legal duty, which you have, if in a circumstance the omission or unlawful act is a major departure from the standard of care expected, a major departure. Now, a case uh, in 2005, um, Harmer, 
said that our issue of major departure is the same as gross negligence. So we're on all fours with the UK. So my, my position, starting position, is yes, it can happen. Um, but there's been a lack of convictions in New Zealand. Um, prior to 1997, the threshold for manslaughter was, um, was just carelessness or negligence. Um, and Sir Duncan McMillan at that point did a report, and his report was quite interesting. Um, that's what he said. Manslaughter is an inappropriate crime for acts of mere carelessness as distinct from gross negligence or recklessness. The law provides other sanctions against mere carelessness. New Zealand law is needlessly out of step with other comparable jurisdictions, and this, I think, is important and it's come through later on. The law in its present form is counterproductive to the makings of good health because the law may result in health professionals practising defensive me medicine. So that was why there was a drop. There was a, the, the, the standard was incre increased to a major departure at that time, um, and since then there have been no prosecutions or convictions. But there have been no prosecutions, um, which is, I think, what will happen. And, and, I, and again, asking, I asked the question, well, why has it happened? There have been deaths, um, clearly, so why haven't there been any prosecutions? And um, so Ron Patterson, I think, answered the question for us, and so I'll plagiarise what he said. Um, and this is what he said when he was leaving the HDC. Um, first of all, he, he said that criminal prosecution would frustrate the disciplinary bodies and mechanisms already in place. And I think we have those, and you know, you're all aware of those. Um, Criminal conviction isn't appropriate for doctors who lack ill intent, which I think is a very clear and sensible comment. Criminal conviction doesn't benefit the family of the deceased, does not necessitate apology, examination or sanction, and coronial inquests in New Zealand are increasingly doing that for you. So you, they're, they're, they're starting to, they're, they're fulfilling that process. Um, uh, what was the next one? Was if medical mass becomes more prevalent in New Zealand, it will in fact hinder accountability rather than uphold it. And I think that's right. If, if, that's the defensive mechanism type issue. And there are other rehab, disciplinary and rehabilitative measures already in place. And what I've done is I've given you an idea. Death by a thousand arrows. <laughs> so you know you, there's, there isn't a vacuum of, of things that can be, as you all know, a vacuum of, of, of steps that can be taken, more appropriate steps even taken. You are a very well-regulated um, profession. Um, and that is seen by a lot of... I think by everyone as being the more appropriate way of dealing with it. So what was the reaction and outcome? Uh, there was a, a review um, undertaken by Sir, Sir Norman Williams. I'll just brief, briefly on this. Putting it into context, since 2014, there's been 20 cases in the UK where gross negligence by a, a medical professional has been in, investigated. And out of that, there were four that went to prosecution, so only Dr Barbara Garber um, was convicted. So one conviction and all that time. Um, and that's caused a great outcry, obviously, and, 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 a, and a review over there. Um, and I think there's a move towards uh, uh, um, making it even tougher, tougher. They're going to adopt the, the Scottish test, which I, I'm, I tried to find out exactly what that was, and I'm sorry, I couldn't in time available. They're going to make the director, director of prosecutions or asking that the director of be personally responsible for... for uh, um, authorising such a prosecution, and for him to be required, or him or her to be required, to explain why it is in the public interest. Um, improve guidelines for investigation and have a, a, a one investigative team so that there's consistency. Um, and protect the learning culture, which I'm going to come to, which is, in, in the, in the Barbara Gabb decision, a lot, of, a lot of emphasis was put on her self-reflective notes. Um, and I'll come to that a bit later, and we'll have a discussion about that. And so what, 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 hap what, what, what they want to do in the UK is make those privileged so, so that you can, so that they are protected. So that what your self-reflections are not going to be plonked out in court and, and used against you. Um, could the good news is that just recently the Court of Appeal overturned the decision to remove Dr Barbagava's name from the register and she'll be back at work very shortly, which is good. Um, uh, it's been a terrible, obviously, situation for her, but... Um, but that's been a long and, and drawn out process. Um, I just would like to, I suppose I'd, I'll just sum it up and then we'll get to some questions. It's that while I'm, I, I can never say to you, with a, I'm a typical lawyer, I'll never say absolutely no, you can't be prosecuted, but I'm going to say that I am absolutely certain that the law in New Zealand will not allow you, or, or the authorities will not. not embrace a situation where you would be prosecuted for, for medical manslaughter. And I think that's two reasons. First of all, 
a prosecution or a conviction is to punish, all right, and we have disciplinary processes in place that adequately deal with that in a, in a medical context, and deal with it very well. Uh, and two, it's there to avoid reoccurrence and, and, and to learn, and we have coronial inquests which do that and are increasingly, increasingly being more adversarial, unfortunately, but, but they're still they're still doing that. And so I think we have a system in place that, that reports that. I think the outcry and the review that's arisen in the UK before this will only will only harden the resolve in New Zealand for us not to follow that, that example. So I am wanting you to leave here not at all nervous about the fact that we have we still we theoretically have the ability to, to, to be to be prosecuted. But there are two practical considerations I want we can talk about these for me is the use of written reflections and I'll ask got the communicator to answer any questions or comment or not. There are two, two, two observations I'd like to make. The first is that your written reflections um, and, and the, the, the use of adverse event and all those sorts of, of um, things. The, my, um, my experience is that you're very good at, at personal reflections and if I'm going to be critical, probably too good at it. Some of you are very, very hard on yourselves. Um, and so my, 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 my suggestion to you in respect to this is always use it. They are incredibly useful, and, and I think we all acknowledge and authorities acknowledge that, that they shouldn't be used in this context. Um, but I would always recommend when I see them come through that you have them tested by a, a trusted colleague because often, more often than not, I think you're being far too hard on yourselves, um, and that can be an issue. So you, you, you're, too, you're too good at throwing yourself under the bus at times. Um, and so use MPS, use people like Dr. Communicator, just test it, and, because I, sometimes when I see an initial draft of a, a response or an apology, I go, whoa, you know, you're actually not that bad. You know, you're okay, you can pull this back a bit. Um, and the second is the role of the independent expert, because the, for me, when seeing this, in the Barbara Gabb decision, the independent expert called by the prosecution was incredibly critical. Um, and it's the tyranny of hindsight that, that comes into these, that comes to play. And a lot of independent experts, and you'll be asked to be an independent expert, and you'll, you'll, you'll be on the side of an independent expert sometimes, will say, look, I'm aware of the tyranny of hindsight, and then they go on to criticise on the basis of, of hindsight, because it's incredibly difficult not to. And, and all, I, all I, I see it all the time, and all I, I ask you to do is, I think it's important from any profession that we are robust and and we have integrity, and if we have to criticise, we criticise, and that will keep us, that, that's important for any, any but we need, to, we need to be sympathetic. And when you look at the list of complaints made by, against Dr. Bowergar, but when you look at them on the list, you go, oh, yes, that's terrible. But these things happened over a period of time when other things were happening, and it's never, it is never that simple. Um, so I suppose that's an, a, 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 a thought I would just leave you with, is that it's very important we have robust and open dialogue. It's very important we have robust independent assessment of our, of our conduct, and that we, we, we put our hand up to do it when we're asked, we need to understand the tyranny of hindsight and not just give it lip service. So those are my two considerations. I don't know, um, Dr. Jim, if you would like to say anything else, but we're happy to answer any questions about that whole saga. Right. Want, um, Go for it. Yes, I actually have had some. Hmm? Should I say something? Go down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Kamenek just, just wants to add a couple of things before we take questions. Yes, yes just a couple of things. Um, first is to just say that we wouldn't be sitting here talking about Dr. Baba Garbar case if there wasn't for uh, British General Medical Council. I mean, do note that they appealed the decision of disciplinary tribunal, which was appropriate, you know, to sanction a doctor who was on the day negligence. I am, you know, I'm with the MPS, not with you know, New Zealand Medical Council, but I do believe that our Medical Council would not do anything like that. You know, just to appeal the decision of disciplinary tribunal, which is to sanction the doctor. I mean, I can't guarantee, but it would be, you know, I, I, I wish to believe that that is impossible. So that is um, one point I have to make. Um, another point is about these reflection, reflection notes which worked against uh, Dr. Bava Garba. I mean, I'm a doctor and uh, um, so are you. And we quite often make these informal notes 
for example, you're interviewing a patient, you are, you know, a patient is consulting you or jotting down little notes just to refresh your memory later on when you have to do your sort of typing. So what is a legal position of those informal notes? And I don't know, Sean, whether you can answer that. You know, I, I, I can't. We, we even have a, a, a couple of um, cases where a draft of the report um, has been used in the context of uh, criticizing and maybe even you know, prosecuting doctors. So what, what is a, a, a legal position of, of draft reports, so, so of something that is not even yet become a report? Um, Sean, can you comment on that? Uh, is that working? You can hear me, yes. The problem is that in a criminal, I'm, uh, and again, I'll, I'll start scaring you by putting this into a criminal context. In a criminal context, um, your handwritten notes or anything that was relevant to it would potentially be admissible. All right? So and that, that's in a criminal context. So if you've written handwritten notes at the time, contemporary notes that, that still exist, um, and uh, a, a, then you would, they would definitely be admissible in a criminal prosecution context. But the, take, not, not, and that's different in the sort of processes, the disciplinary process and other processes that we're undertaking. Um, but in a criminal context, yes, it would, you, you can, I could not say to you now that they would be inadmissible. And drafts would be would be admissible anymore. The, the value of them and the probity of them would be tested by the, the the judge, but you couldn't. I can't sit here and tell you that they would not be admissible. And so um, this is the cynical lawyer in me. But but what once you've what, what, uh, there is no point in keeping drafts or keeping those notes once you've used them. You know, once you've once you've used them, they're, they're better off. But again, that's my scaring you again. I'm scaring you. I, I don't believe. All right, I don't believe you should alter your practices on the basis of the Barbara decision. I don't think there is anything in the Barbara decision that should cause you to alter your practices. There you go. Yeah, you, you know, the New Zealand public, you know, um, just believes that um, the doctor in New Zealand cannot be sued. You know, I mean, that's, and that's probably a biggest protective factor against Baba Garba happening in New Zealand, isn't it? Uh, a suit for negligence, sorry. <laughs> um, but as, you, as Sean said, that's not entirely true. Uh, but chances for that are extremely, extremely low. Uh, so, you know, uh, as a doctor, I'm not worried. And neither are uh, you, I think. You know, I was expecting when this case was, you know, uh, published here in New Zealand and attracted attention, I was expecting that MPS would get, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of worried calls from worried doctors, and that actually didn't happen. I don't think we had more than maybe 10 calls, a few emails on behalf of, of a group of doctors asking, you know, for explanation what happened, and in particular whether it could happen in New Zealand. So, you know, if you're not worried about this, that's fine. <laughs> you don't have to be. Okay. okay. Um, questions? There's quite a few, oh, wow. actually. Where do I start? I'll start here. <clears throat> do you have a photograph of Dr. Bawa Garba for us? Uh, and, and this is important, I yes, think. Yes, it is. I, I know you, she was uh, Muslim and she had a high ab. And I, and I actually should have said that in my presentation. No. I don't have a... Because have a, um, a, there was, we were racist over time. I'd so like it not to matter. Yeah, I know. But I think it matters. I, I think a woman that's a Muslim that's black, unfortunately, I, I think it mattered in this I case. do. I do agree with you. Um, and I, and it, it was in my notes to actually mention that. There was certainly an outcry that, that would this have happened to a white male... Um, and, and I and I I, agree, I, abs I absolutely agree with it. She was a, a Muslim lady with a with a high ab, and there was definitely that overtone to it. Um, hi, my name's Jo. I'm from Auckland. Um, I had two questions. In, if this happened in New Zealand, is it likely that this would have the team would have suggested this should have gone to ACC as a treatment misadventure case, and then the family would have had closure and potentially a payout that way? Um, and the other question is. Is there death by a thousand arrows in the UK? Are they similarly kind of regulated to us, and is it more that the GMC did something very odd? Yeah, we, 
There's no thousand errors in New no, Zealand, no. isn't it? But there is a hundred. <laughs> uh, I think the answer is it would have gone to ACC. Um, that, that's first, uh, also, it would have gone to a cronial inquest. So there would have been two bites of cherry on that. Um, so, and that would have been a, the process. And, and I think in that process, the, the, um, the family would have been totally involved in that process. And, and that would have been a, a better out, And that is a better outcome. Um, and you, you're seeing a coronial inquest now much more involvement of families, I don't know if any of you recently. Um, so they're, they're, they're taking an active role, they're cross-examining, um, and that it poses its challenges, but in fact, on the other side of the coin, it does give that outlet, and it's a better outlet than, than having them. Because there was clearly, uh, reading through it, and this is only a vibe I get, there's clearly a pressure on the pros from the family on this prosecution after three and a half years. I, mean, I think that was a catalyst for it. Hi, Sylvia Boys. I'm an emergency physician at Counties Manukau, and um, her day is my average day. We are short-staffed. I'm managing several resuscitations at once. I often do not follow up a lactate till several hours later when I see it. I sometimes struggle along finding a potassium of 7.9 two hours later, and I'm just grateful the patient hasn't arrested in the meantime. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really distressed that you refer to her as negligent when the system she was working in set her up to fail... The system we are working in sets us up to fail, and really we need to put the onus on the management that does not adequately staff our shifts to be safe for us, to be safe for the patients. And I'd really like to see more leadership from them here. Look, uh, I, I, absolutely agree, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, it was, there was absolutely no regard taken of those mitigating circumstances. I, I, I mean, in that, I, I deliberately read the that out from the judge, because I think that's an, it's an atrocious and, and lack, total lack of understanding response from, from a judiciary, um, and, ho and thankfully that's been overturned now. But, but that shows you the ignorance of, of, of what's happening at the, at the, at the coalface when it gets into that kind of, of, of um, situation. And so, yeah, I, I absolutely, I don't have, and it's because I'm a lawyer, I don't have an understanding, uh, clearly the judge who was, who was hearing that appeal had absolutely no understanding of it, but didn't stop him from saying some, I thought, quite outrageous things. Just, just, uh, just one, one thing. I, I, I'm absolutely sure you didn't want, want it to come like that. We didn't refer, or we don't refer to Dr. Bahagar by his negligence. I mean, the system did. The judges did. Um, uh, whether she was negligent or not, I'll leave that to you. There's um, many, many um, aspects of the case that we cannot talk about. There's a lot of other things that, we, that, that the courts consider. I'm not defending the, the, the court here or anything. Uh, but that's simply how, even in New Zealand, you know, when there's a, a, a clinical you know, error, uh, the practice is referred to as being negligent at times. Um, uh, I absolutely take your point on the system, uh, which sometimes leaves doctors completely unsupported. Um, and if I have to say, unfortunately, that is taken into consideration during investigation, but not so much when it comes to the, to the point of uh, HDC, for example. Uh, uh, passing opinions or um, so it is taken in consideration but it doesn't affect the judgment at the end so much okay. Katie oh, uh, Katie Ben from Nelson and Anesthetist and um, there is so much wrong with this case it's hard to know where to start um, the system's failures that set her up were partly because she was unsupported her senior consultant had was somewhere else yeah. So she was on her own. Her one junior was sitting at a computer chasing results. While she wasn't checking the chest x-ray, she was doing a lumbar puncture. You know, she had a lot of other kids to talk about. The enalapril that the mother gave her was as a result of the hospital having a policy that children could be given their own regular medications even if the doctors hadn't prescribed them. Mm. And she was unaware of that policy. And I find it hard to believe that you can be convicted of manslaughter when you're unaware of the hospital policies because you've come back so unsupported and been thrown into the mix. Do you think there should be some suggestion that actually we should have a role for corporate manslaughter? Does Leicestershire Hospitals NHS Trust have a duty of care to their patients? And should that be looked at? Because there was a suggestion that they were going to go to court at some point. That's been damped down. The mother is adamant that mm -hmm. the doctor should be hung out to dry, partly probably because she feels guilty. Um, she has 
rightly or wrongly got that to bear. But do you think we should be looking okay. more at the hospitals? If I'm, yeah, if, you, if I'm honest, I think the hospital were more responsible for this than, than the doctor. I, I don't think you should have... I don't think manslaughter should... I think a manslaughter conviction or, or prosecution does anyone any good, it, 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 be it the doctor or, or, the, or the hospital. I, don't, I think we have a much better way of dealing with those issues in New Zealand. So I, I don't... I don't so I don't, but, but, but if anyone was responsible, and it goes to that point that the doctors in, in the UK made, is that you, 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 you have, you know, if, if people turn up for, for work in other industries or areas and there is a health and safety issue, that, that, then they're entitled to go home. And, and, you know, they say, well, there's a health and safety issue, I'm going home. And, and it seems to me from hearing from that, you, have, you suffer that all the time, but you don't have that option. Um, and, and that's the, that's the problem, and, and that's got to be understood. And I, I don't think cr any cr any criminal process would appropriately address that, as we found in the Barbara Gallagher decision and that ridiculous judgment from the the, the, the court of the appeal um, when he dealt with when he dealt with it, because he had obviously no understanding of it. So, so my I think we are in a better position in New Zealand because we deal with those issues in a, in a better way in, in front of, of tribunals and, and, and uh, in, in, a, in an area where people have more knowledge of those issues and, and more understanding of those issues. I mean, system issues are extremely important. I mean, in my opinion, one of the biggest problems in this case is that the hospital put a young doctor, okay, she, she was, you know, not that un, inexperienced, she was a senior reg, registrar, however, she just returned from 14 months uh, 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 leave, uh, maternity leave. So for the hospital to put a doctor like that into extremely busy uh, uh, clinic to look after the ward, ED department, the whole hospital from a pediatric point of view, without the adequate support, I think that's that's the that, that's where the problem actually originated. Um, and then, you know, once, once you make one little error, then, you know, there's a cascade of, of, of errors that follow. It's interesting. I, that, that, I think that Greg here is making the point that those situations are occurring all of the time. Mm. That's, that's the problem. Yeah. Mm. So we've got one, two, three, four, and I'm actually going to extend another sort of three or four minutes because there's a lot of interest in this. If people don't mind delaying after uh, morning tea a little bit, we'll go extra five minutes. So here first. Hi, I'm Amanda Tristram, I'm a gynae oncologist in Wellington. I spent 25 years working in the NHS, uh, including at the time of this case. Uh, she was completely hung out to dry mm. by her consultant, the hospital, and I have to say her defence union. And we have seen it time and time again in the UK where the, the establishment, the old boys club, I'm sorry to say it, but it's true, have closed ranks against junior doctors, often female and often non-white, non-UK, born and bred. Um, if you look at your rules for manslaughter, you could easily put the consultant and the hospital in those boxes and they would have failed the same mm. test. The consultant had a duty of care, the hospital had a duty of care. So I think the question, uh, could it happen in New Zealand? We can answer, would we allow that to happen to one of our trainees? Would our defense union allow that to happen? And, and actually, as a medical profession, bears as much responsibility as the lawyers and judges do for that having happened. Um, and I guess the second question is, do we do that to our trainees? Do we let them take the front line after 14 months away from work? Do we have return to work policies? And that will also answer the question. We can look at our own hospitals and we can decide if it will happen here or not. Yeah, I, I can't answer those two questions because of, of my legal perspective. All I can say is I think there is a culture in New Zealand that, that from the basis of, what, of the systems we have in place and generally that would not create yeah. a Barbara situation. I, I mean, I, I agree, and I think unless you've yeah. uh, worked in the NHS, you, it'd be very easy Hopefully. to underestimate the yeah. degree to which it would close ranks to protect the I status quo. And I don't mean by that there isn't the circumstances, as you quite rightly point out, and everyone else, that, that, that they are consistent with what happens. Yeah. I just think that, that, that the processes we have in place uh, is and, it very and the, the culture we have around, around here would, would not 
would not see that happen, perhaps. Would, as, as it, would it be really cut. cheeky to ask who did defend her? No, not me. <laughs> so, can, 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 I, can I just just ask you to clarify something? You said that she was left hang to dry by her defence union. Can, how do well, you know that? Well, I, I think even the criminal conviction was a for me was that's where the, everything went wrong to start with. Uh, and so, you know, MPS, that... MPS was you know defending Dr. Mm. Bala Garba and still doing that. It's on our appeal that you know the appeal is now in but, process. So I've certainly come. I mean, this is a bit. But I've come across other cases where um, there was a conflict of interest because if the junior is found not guilty, then the senior and the management are by default guilty, and so perhaps as not as much. Uh, weight is put behind the defence. I'm being a bit controversial. I don't want to take this too far because everybody gets bored. But, you know, uh, I, I, I think that's much less... I'm trying to say I think part of the reason I'm here is because I think that's much uh, less I, likely I, to happen I, here. So I I'm think th kind of being you, optimistic. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, and, you know, I, I need to say this, you know, and, and, and uh, that MPS has been you know, defending Dr. Baba Garba very strongly. The problem is when the case is, when there is a legal process going on, you are very restricted in uh, what you can say. Um, there's a lot of questions, but you know, in order not to make it even worse, you can't go and to protect, you know, your, your, your client's uh, confidentiality and the legal process, you, you cannot go out with full information and almost advertise your, your sort of involvement and, and, and position in the whole case. That's why maybe um, there was a little bit of criticism of, of MPS for not defending Dr. Gava Barba uh, enough or strongly, uh, but that's, that's really, I want to ensure that is not the case. We did everything that, that could have been done. This will probably have to be the last question, unfortunately, but... I'm Audrey Seth. I work in forensic psychiatry in Auckland. I just want to follow up on some of my colleagues' comments, and it's about the Swiss cheese model of uh, uh, incidents occurring. Um, it seems very easy to scapegoat an individual whilst not actually addressing the systems issues of IT, workload, and all of that. And... Certainly the um, SERPs, the special incident review panels I've been involved in, my colleagues have been involved in, I've been frustrated that one of the remits of these investigative panels is they have a very small remit and it doesn't address the system's issues. And so it means that they will occur again and again. Those holes will line up and it's so easy to blame the doctor at the end of it. If we don't address the system's issues, it will happen again. Mm. You know, the, the, oh, sorry, you sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, in New Zealand, I mean, system issues are addressed. For example, health and disability commissioner can breach the provider, be it the DHB, and that usually happens, you know, well, exclusively happens for systemic issues. So systemic issues in New Zealand are addressed even in, in the context of the process of, um, you know, investigating complaints, uh, in, in, within Medical Council and, and the HDC. The problem that doctors have are we, we, we are always put between the rock and the hard place on the day. Now, on one hand, you have your you know, ethical and professional responsibility to do what's, what, what's, what you can do best for your patients. And if you're put in a, in a position on the day where there's a severe resource limitations, what do you do? I mean, you cannot, doctors cannot say, well, you know, this is really unsupportive environment and basically well a risky environment for, for me to work. I'm not going to work. Who looks after the patients? I mean, you can raise the issues later on and address it with management. But on a day, what, what do you do? Do you leave your patients to die? We need to finish up. Sorry for the people who couldn't ask the questions that they wanted to ask. It's obviously generated a lot of interest, this case. I wanted to make a couple of comments, actually, just before we finish. Um, there is something that we can do. I mean, a lot of us will we'll be doing health and, health and Disability Commissioner reports on colleagues, and uh, I've done several of these. And I think there's an opportunity, whenever you do one of these, to look at the system 
uh, and comment on the system as much as on the actual case and actually draw the focus back to the system. So that's something that some of us can do from time to time. Um, and lastly, I just want to finish up by uh, just thanking MPS for the work that you do for uh, our ASMS members. Um, and you, I know that you work very closely with our industrial officers. Um, you provide a, a counselling service uh, for our members. And we value the, uh, the programmes that you have with the Cognitive Institute, which MPS owns, and for also sponsoring last night's conference dinner. So thank, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.